Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to SEC. Today we are continuing our series in Matthew's Gospel and we're looking at chapter 8 um, from verse 23. Why don't um, you uh, grab a Bible and I will read it and you can follow along as I do. So Matthew 8 from verse 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. When he arrived the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men were coming from the tombs to meet him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs were feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they went out and went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to a demon possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Let's pray. Father, please help us. As we look at your word now, thank you that you are uh, a God who speaks to us. Thank you that your word is living and active. And I pray that we would hear and understand what you have to say to us and respond in obedience and faith for Jesus sake. Amen. So the men were amazed and they asked, what kind of man is this? And we're essentially going to see over the next four weeks as we unpack the rest of chapter eight, and nine. The answer to this question, what kind of man is this? In this part of Matthew's Gospel, we see short, snappy accounts of Jesus's ministry and his miracles that he performed around the area, around the Sea of Galilee. We don't find all the details in these stories that we see in other Gospels, just the bare bones of what Jesus did and said and how people respond. And the question that's asked, what kind of man is this? Let's face it, is, is really the most important question we can ever ask ourselves. Who is Jesus? And in a sense, today we're getting back to the basics. We're unwrapping the fancy paper and decorations and all the topics and questions we love to, to, to kind of discuss a theological issue. And we're just getting back to the very heart of it and to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one it's all about. So if you are a Christian today, why can you trust Jesus with confidence and continue to trust Jesus with everything you have, even in the messy and chaotic storms of life? We're going to see two big reasons here. And if you're someone here today watching who's not yet a Christian or not sure where you stand, I'm so glad you've joined us today. You're most welcome. And I hope that we will see, that you will see what the Bible says about Jesus, why you can and should trust Jesus with everything. So what kind of man is this? Why can we trust and follow Jesus today? Well, two things we're going to see. Jesus is the king of creation and Jesus is the destroyer of evil. So let's take the first of those then. Firstly, Jesus, the king of creation. Matthew tells these stories with few details. Jesus got into the boat, the disciples followed. Without warning, a furious storm came upon the lake, so the waves swept over the boat. Now, there's nothing unusual about this. 12 miles long by about eight miles wide, the lake was deep at a point surrounded by mountain range of uh, over 2,000 feet. The geography of the lake meant furious storms like this could quickly stir up. This one was obviously bad. The experienced fishermen on board genuinely feared for their lives. There was panic and there was turmoil uh, in every man on board apart from one. The Lord Jesus 
sleeping in a cushion on the bones. So verse 25. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. The panic, the chaos, the confusion as they desperately wake Jesus up. Just unfathomable that he could be asleep at a moment like this. Jesus, with all calmness, all authority, all control, speaks words to the disciples and to creation. Firstly, he rebukes the fearful fishermen. Verse 26, he replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and waves, and it was completely calm. See, it's a lack of faith on the part of the disciples that Jesus highlights here. They panicked because they didn't place their faith in Jesus. And then just like that, he rebukes the winds and the waves. Quiet, be still. And it is completely calm. The storm stops like that as quickly as it came. As the weather and sea obey the voice of Jesus. Now the disciples would have known their psalms and the psalms speak of how it is the Lord God Almighty who is in control of the sea. So Psalm 89 verses 8 and 9. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves melt up, you still them. Or Psalm 107, verse 29, he stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. And here it is Jesus who stills the raging sea to a whisper. He demonstrates so clearly for all to see that he is the Lord God Almighty, the one able to calm the raging sea with just the words. If you were there that day, round the Sea of Galilee, where would you want to be? Where would you feel safest? Standing with your feet firmly on the shore, watching on from a distance or there in the boat with Jesus? Where would you be safest? The disciples were afraid because they failed to trust Jesus when it mattered. But they were safe because Jesus was with them. The safest place to be in the storm is there with the one who's in control. The one who came to bring calm and peace in the chaos and disorder of life. In your life today, where are you safest? Watching the storm from a distance? Well, if you are in Christ and if Christ dwells in you by his spirit, then you are safe in the midst of the storm because Jesus is with you in it. You see, the real storm in the story is also a picture of chaos and disorder we find in our fallen world today. It reminds us of the brokenness and hurt caused by sin. The chaos and disorder are present the moment that sin enters the world and they've continued ever since. But it's into this chaos and disorder of the storm that Jesus brings calm and peace. What are the particular storms in your life today, I wonder? What are the things you dread? What are the situations you, that, 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 that you face in life that fill you most with fear? Or the medical diagnosis you're still waiting for the results of? The restructuring at work that makes your job feel so uncertain? A family member you lost tragically and unexpectedly? Or perhaps it's simply a problem with your child that you can't see a good solution to. The unresolved tension in your marriage. What are the storms you cry out to God to deliver you from? The times that leave you questioning God's goodness, unable to see where God is. Jesus never promises to take the storms away. The Apostle Paul tells us the storms he faced throughout his life, um, he, he faced many storms both metaphorically and indeed literally too. But Paul tells of how he prayed at a time, three times that God would remove some, some, some thorn from his flesh, he describes it. He doesn't tell us specifically what this point of suffering is that he's referred to, but he tells us plainly that God doesn't answer his prayer in the way he hopes. God doesn't remove the thorn 
from Paul's flesh. Instead, God speaks these words of comfort to Paul in the midst of his suffering. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Faith in Christ is enough to get us through, even if the storm doesn't lift. His grace is enough and his power and glory are magnified when we're at our weakest. So back to the storm in the, in the story, the problem wasn't actually the storm. The storm was quite normal and, and we see all was to end well. The problem was the disciples' response, their panic, their fear. Jesus was with them in the boat. They only needed to trust Jesus. And it's into the chaos and the disorder that Jesus came to bring peace. Perhaps not now, maybe not as you would hope or imagine, but one day, fully and finally, the chaos and disorder and uncertainty that we know the pain of only too well, the world will one day be restored and peace will prevail. And Jesus here gives a small preview, as it were, a glimpse of the reality of what Jesus came to do. He's come to bring the order out of the storm and he can do that with just a word. So he calls us to trust him, to trust him in the storm and he shows us that he is trustworthy. He demonstrates he himself has the power and authority of God as king of creation. That's the first thing. The second thing we see, Jesus the destroyer of evil. And the story carries on in verse 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men came from the tombs to meet him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us? Son of God, they shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? The other gospel accounts have only one man, but that doesn't need to, to, to concern us too much, I don't think. There were clearly two men here, but perhaps one plays a more prominent role in the story, or is worse maybe, or, or sticks out more to the other writers. And these two men are possessed by an evil spirit who's controlling them and making them act dangerously, destructively. Demons are evil spirits, are fallen angels who the devil uses to tempt and destroy and, and lead us away from God. We sometimes don't know what to make of the devil. We see the sort of caricatures of the devil and demons and children dressed up as them at Halloween. But let's not believe that talk of demons and spiritual powers is just sort of harmless fun or myths or fables. The devil believes in us even if we don't believe in him. So 1 Peter 1 verse 5 warns us, be alert and sober minded because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. The devil prowls around looking for somebody to devour, to lead astray, to destroy. And he will do this by telling you not to go to church this week, by putting excuses, reasons in your path, or by telling you not to read the Bible, by making something pop up on your phone to distract you at the moment you begin to pray. His nagging voice will tell you God's word is far too restrictive and, and God won't mind if you bend the rules a little over here and you know, you, 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 you know, only half obey him. He'll make things you know are wrong look appealing. He'll encourage you to blame your sin on others. We're in a daily spiritual battle. We need to be alert to the enemy and his destructive and yet tempting schemes. And in these two men, we see so clearly the destructive work of Satan in someone's life. For demons cause these men to act violently, irrationally and dangerously. It must have been a terrifying ordeal for those who lived in that area. And yet the evil spirits living inside the men are only too aware of who Jesus is. They acknowledge, they're talking to the Son of God. And they also speak of an appointed time. That's a future day when the Lord Jesus will rid 
the earth of all sin and evil finally, once and for all. And they know their time is up because they recognise Jesus for who he is. And so look on with me from verse 30. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon possessed men. Jesus sends the demons out of the men with a word. He says, go. And they are restored. It's so simple and yet so profound. The sinful, dark, evil powers that have such a devastating hold over someone's life are cast out by the one who brings light out of darkness, who brings life out of death. Jesus came to tackle sin and the devil and death head on. And he is victorious. And one day Jesus will return and restore everything to how it was meant to be, only better. And so the Bible ends with us looking forward to Jesus's return and his final victory and the peace and restoration that will follow. Just listen to this at the end of Revelation 21 verse 6. Um, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their gods. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The world will one day be free of all evil and the demons and the devil. There'll, there'll be no more suffering or sin or death. So again, here we have a taster, a small glimpse of what Jesus came to do. The death defeating saviour who came to rid the world of sin and evil through the cross, who will finally do so once and for all, has demonstrated here his authority and his power over evil. Jesus, the destroyer of evil. And yet, how does the story end? Verse uh, 34. Just look at the final verse for me. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Such a chilling end. All throughout time, people have rejected the Messiah. They want him to leave the region. They plead with Jesus to leave them alone. They preferred the pigs to the people. It's shocking. Perhaps their livelihood had been uh, destroyed as the pigs had died. But the focus here isn't on the pigs. Jesus' focus is on the people, people loved by God, who Jesus lovingly restores. Yet they say to Jesus, get lost. We don't want you here. The crunch verse here, what do you want with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us? before the appointed time, the appointed time. The demons know their time is up. They know this man has come to defeat evil and sin and bring in God's kingdom, where sinful, broken people could be lovingly restored through Christ. And this appointed time was to come. And we're still waiting for this final day and final restoration, but Jesus demonstrates his authority over evil as he gives a taste of what is to come. See, sometimes you have uh, housing developments around here, around Exeter, and this sort of side of Exeter, there's just housing developments going up all over the place. And, and you see what happens uh, when uh, the, the, the land gets sold, they put a fence up around the outside, often they'll put boards, sometimes with sort of pictures of what is going to be there, or um, offers of uh, houses and what's going on. And then they will build, they'll quickly get in, they'll build one show home and they'll sort of be able to open up the fence and you can go in and you can look at one house which is beautiful and you could go in and look around the house and it's all been decorated out and yet the rest of the site is just mud and rubble and mess but you've got the one house for people to come in and look and to see what the development is going to look like in the fullness of time 
And it's a bit like that with Jesus here. He shows us as he calms the storm a glimpse of the peace that he came to bring. We see as he cast out the demons a glimpse of the victory over sin Jesus came to achieve. Jesus came to heal broken lives. He came to bring peace into chaos and disorder. And he shows us it and gives us a taste of what is to come. And so the application for us today really is, is simply to trust him and to keep trusting him in the messy chaos of our lives as they perhaps unravel before us. Keep looking to him. The only place you are safe in the storm. Colossians 1.14 said he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. What a wonderful sin defeating, evil destroying saviour who's rescued us from darkness, death and despair and brings new life and hope and restoration. This calls for, for renewed confidence in Jesus calls for us to go on trusting him whatever the challenges you may face in the mess and chaos where there is hurt and brokenness and pain where relationships fail to satisfy when you feel let down by others again and again when you cannot understand why God doesn't intervene as you know he could when those you love most seem to keep rejecting Christ or when you feel the full force of the spiritual battle, the full force of spiritual attack. When you're mocked for believing in Jesus. When you're tempted not to speak up at work for Jesus because you know you'll be made to, um, to feel embarrassed or ashamed. Even reading your Bible in the morning is a spiritual battle. The enemy is real, but his time is numbered. Jesus has shown us his power. He's given a taste of what is to come. Jesus the one who brings peace and calm into the chaos and disorder and frustration of living in a broken world. He came to fix it and he has shown us. Jesus the one who came to destroy all evil and free us from the clutches of death. And so we can rejoice in who he really is. How will you respond to Jesus today? Who is this man? The whole town went out to meet Jesus and when they saw him, they plead him to leave their region. How absolutely shocking. The one who is able to help us, the one who can keep us safe, the one who can rescue us from our sin and set us free to enjoy new life and relationship with himself. May our response be wonder and love and worship and praise. Because he is the one worth trusting, the only one who can change things, the one who can keep you safe and the only one who can defeat evil and who has paid for your sin fully on the cross to rescue you. May we respond in faith and continue to look to and trust in Jesus Christ day by day. Amen.